And it's always a tough place with the running back position where you have a position you could get in the draft, like the second, third, fourth, fifth round. You're finding absolute gem at running back, like gem after gem after gem. There's drafts where you have like eight starters in one year. So running back is hard to invest in in free agency because you're overall paying more money for a veteran at a position that is a youth position unless they're a role player or a true upper echelon stud it's hard to pay for a running back in this league right now so let's take a look at the top 10 guys that i see this year in free agency so some things that i took into account more for running back than any other position the number one thing was injuries so if you were just injured or hurt that significantly hurt your chance at being ranked high because you can't be hurt at running back. Your career could be over if you get one or two significant injuries because it's a position about toughness, about balance, about speed, about athleticism. And you can't have that at running back. And then the other thing was versatility. So that was the second thing, versatility. What can you do for me? Can you run? Can you block? Can you catch? And can you play in multiple schemes? So those were the two things I took into account for specifically role type running backs, which I think a lot of these guys are. So let's look. At number one, I have Aaron Jones. I think Aaron Jones is the true standout on this list. He is the best player by far, in my opinion. He can catch the ball very well. He's explosive as a runner. I think he's in his prime right now. And I believe that he will probably go to a new team. I don't really see Green Bay re-signing him. So Aaron Jones is at number one. Number two, Chris Carson. Chris Carson is, when he's healthy, an excellent number one running back. But the question is, is he healthy? I mean, he's never healthy. That's the problem. But I love Chris Carson's style. He's physical. I think he would be excellent in a place like, hey, let's just throw it out there, Buffalo right? Buffalo is, it's cold, it's windy. And when you have a guy like Chris Carson, who's running downhill, it's just tough to tackle that guy. I feel like Chris Carson, if he doesn't go back to Seattle, I would look out for a possible contender snatching him up on maybe a cheaper contract because he does have an injury history, although he's not that old. Number three, Leonard Fournette. This is a guy that could be a smash investment, could be an absolute disaster. Like, we saw both sides of Leonard Fournette this year where he was one of the worst running backs in the league and one of the best running backs in the league. So it just depends on what Leonard Fournette you're getting, but he's still young enough to make an investment as a starter or as a committee guy. Kenyon Drake is, he had a great year last year, but this past year he was underwhelming from an explosive standpoint. He does offer equal value as a runner and receiver, so that's positive. But I don't feel Drake is going to be valued very highly because I just don't see him being that good anymore. I, I just don't see the explosiveness on tape. Mike Davis, number five, I think he is very underrated. We saw it last year. He filled in for CMC and was absolutely awesome in the time that Christian McCaffrey was hurt. I could see him going back to Carolina and being their true starter if Christian McCaffrey does leave and get traded. I could see that. Then we have at number six, I have Jamal Williams. Jamal Williams, I think is a really good RBBC guy, running back by committee guy, where he could catch the ball. He's a good power back. He's kind of a an interesting mold of power and receiving, which is rare. Number seven, I have Marlon Mack. Marlon Mack can be a starter, but he doesn't really catch the ball. He's more of like a LeGarrett Blunt kind of guy where he's a different style of player, but he's like a first and second down guy. You need like a ca pass catcher to go along with him, but he's coming off a significant injury. I'd rank him at number five if he wasn't coming off an Achilles injury, but he is. Number eight, I have James White because I think James White is arguably the best third down running back in the NFL. And when you have that player, even though he's not a true running back, he's more of a receiver. And I also feel he's kind of limited in the teams he can go to. I think he's going to go to Tampa, New England, pretty much nobody else. 
So that's why James White isn't a little higher because I think what he offers a team is actually undervalued. Number nine, James Conner. I don't like James Conner that much as a player, human being, excellent. I think, you know, as a second running back, I think he'd be solid, but I just don't see the explosiveness. I don't see the big playmaking ability. He can do a little bit of everything, which is nice, but I just don't see true number one running back from James Conner. Number 10, Matt Breida. I like Matt Breida, always have. The big problem with him is injuries. Has a significant injury history in terms of he's always banged up. It's not really like he's missed a lot of games, but it's like hamstring here, you know, ankle here, groin there. And it's just like, uh, you know, he, he, you never get 100% of Matt Breida. But he could catch the ball. And when he gets it and he's in open field, he's gone. So those are two things I value. So those are my top 10 running backs in free agency that I look out for to get signed by some teams. I think all offer a little bit different. That's the nice thing about the running back position. So here are my undervalued and buyer beware guys. So my undervalued, you'll see some guys that aren't in the top 10 here. So first, Rex Burkhead. I thought Rex Burkhead was the best running back on New England when he was healthy. He is an excellent, I think this is where he's going to fall in. I think he's an excellent receiver and he doesn't really get to be that in New England because James White. So I think Rex Burkhead is going to end up, I don't know if he'll come back to New England or not, but wherever he goes, I think he'll fill in as like a third down back. I don't think he's going to be looked at as a lead guy. Definitely not. He's coming off of ACL and I think he's just a really good four down player. Like he could play special teams. He can return kicks. He could do a lot of things. And I just was really impressed with Rex Burkhead this year and the last couple of years, honestly. Jarek McKinnon, I think McKinnon could be undervalued, and this is why. He just came back from significant injuries, like missed two seasons and came back. And I think people are going to look at McKinnon as, ah, maybe he's not really had it anymore. You know, he played with Shanahan and he didn't really do anything. And But I look at McKinnon as a guy that maybe he's healthier now. Maybe he's going to be 100%. And if he is, he's one of the better athletes at the position. He is very versatile and he's explosive. So... I'd take a chance on Jarek McKinnon as a veteran, you know, do-it-all type of running back. Wayne Gallman was actually really good replacing Saquon when called upon with a bad offensive line. I thought he performed well. He had like 4.6 yards per carry, which is pretty solid. I think he's a solid number two. Buyer beware, Marlon Mack, because he's coming off of an Achilles. And that's basically the only reason, along with he doesn't catch the ball. And then secondly, Leonard Fournette, because he played behind, I think, an awesome, awesome offensive line. He had Tom Brady, he had a great receiving game, and he had a quarterback that understood, you know, how to get him the ball as a receiver, even though he dropped a lot of passes. They kept the faith. I think Fournette's best place is to go back to Tampa Bay. If he goes elsewhere, unless it's with an elite quarterback or an elite offense, I'd be a little worried. I mean, the guy got cut by Jacksonville for a reason. So even though he put together a great playoffs, I wouldn't fully 100% buy into that. So those are my running back free agent rankings and preview. Now, the wide receiver position. Wide receiver, top 10. Wide receiver, undervalued. Wide receiver, buyer, beware. So at the wide receiver position this year, we have a lot of guys that could be considered number one caliber, like three of them, maybe four of them. And we have a deep list of 20 to 25 guys that I'd consider role players at the very least, maybe number twos, maybe number threes, maybe number fours, but guys that will be on NFL rosters this time in August and will be playing a role for their team that they sign with. So the wide receiver position is probably the most loaded on offense this year and one of the more generally loaded positions in the league. The interesting thing about wide receiver is that it's been like three or four years in a row with excellent wide receiver classes and this year's no exception. There's another great draft class coming up for wide receivers. Last year we saw another great one and that could mean that a lot of teams that are looking for a number two or a number three might just take their chances in the draft instead of signing a veteran number two or number three. That's why some of those guys will be undervalued. But I think the guys that are number one wide receivers are going to be paid and they should be paid because people now realize maybe, just maybe, that they actually matter. So let's look at the wide receiver top 10. 
So my wide receiver top 10, this considers everything, right? Age, fit, you know, versatility, talent, all of it. Number one, Chris Godwin. Reason Chris Godwin's number one. Although I think Allen Robinson is a better player than Chris Godwin, like right now. I think Chris Godwin, he's younger. He's actually only 24, guys. 24. He's so young and he's an excellent player. He is an excellent teammate. Everybody speaks glowingly about Chris Godwin as a player and as a person. And then you have the versatility aspect of he can play in the slot. He can play outside. He's played with multiple quarterbacks. He's succeeded with both. And he's a guy that's in a system that doesn't do a lot of favors for wide receivers. It's really like line up and just run your route and get open. And if he went to a system that actually helped him get open, he would be like a hundred catch guy for the next five years. So Chris Godwin is a really good player. Allen Robinson, I think is going to go more to a team that wants to win like right now or within the next two to three years because he's 27 and he's kind of an old 27. He's had some injuries, but he's a really good player. I'd consider him a borderline, if not a top 10 wide receiver. And he's good basically everywhere. He doesn't have the burning speed, but he's one of the better route runners in the league. And he'd fit with the guy that accurate passer. He'd be a very, very good like number two, but I feel like he'd be still a good number one on like 20 teams. So Allen Robinson, just an awesome player and has never had a good quarterback. So I'd like to see him go somewhere with a good quarterback. Number three, Kenny Galladay. He could follow Matthew Stafford. He could stay in Detroit. He could go elsewhere. But Kenny Galladay is a different type of guy. He's more like a prime version of Alshon Jeffrey. He's like a go up and get it type of receiver. And he doesn't get open. He's like never open, but he's always open. That's Kenny Galladay. He's an excellent red zone threat. He's excellent down the field, actually, for a guy that's not very fast. And he's a huge frame. So quarterbacks that like big framed receivers with long arms will like Kenny Galladay. Will Fuller is a burner and I think is like maybe an like top 30 receiver. He's not quite a top 15, top 20, but he's like a top 30 receiver. He did have the whole roids thing last year. So you got to take that into account. That might actually hurt his stock to some teams, but I think Will Fuller is a number one wide receiver, lower end, really good number two. He's kind of one-dimensional, but the one dimension he's good at, he's amazing at. So there's that's always a plus. And then you go to number six, five, who's Juju Smith-Schuster. Juju Smith-Schuster is, I'm not a huge fan of, honestly. Like you guys know, if you know me, I don't like his personality. I don't like how he makes everything about himself. But as a football player, he's still young. And he, I think, might be able to improve on another team. And this is why. I think Pittsburgh's scheme has been very vanilla over the last two years. And I think if he goes to a different team as a slot number two receiver, he would be a high-end number two receiver. But if you're paying for him as a number one wide receiver, you're going to have issues. Because he's not a number one receiver. He doesn't have the speed. He doesn't have the ability to be a number one. But as a number two, he'd be a great investment, in my opinion. Uh, number six, Antonio Brown. The only reason Antonio Brown's six and not like four is because he's a little older and he's Antonio Brown. He's going to only play for one team and one team only. That's the Bucks. He's not going to, he's not even a free agent, basically. Number seven, Corey Davis. Corey Davis is, I think, a really solid number two. I do not see him as a number one because he's going to be very inconsistent. But when he's playing well, he can play very well and actually take over a game. He was, used to be, you know, a high overall pick in a draft. A lot of teams are going to value that. Some team that maybe had him rated very highly that think they could maybe improve him a little here and there, maybe takes a chance on him with a big contract. And I think that's where you could get in trouble is he's still kind of young. And if you're trying to pay him to be like the next 
top 20 guy in this league. I don't think he can quite get there, but I do think he's a top 40 guy at the very least, and he can contribute in a good offense for him. Curtis Samuel is like the wild card of the group. I think he has very high ceiling. He has great potential. He has great athleticism, great speed, all of it. But he's still, you know, young, kind of raw. He's a great athlete, but he's not a pure wide receiver's wide receiver yet. And if you're going to pay him as a number one or number high-end number two, you're going to be in trouble. But if you get him as a number three with upside, he could be a very good value. Number nine, Marvin Jones. Marvin Jones, I think, might be hitting the lower end of his career. That's what I'm concerned about. But he had a really good year last year, and he's a solid number two wide receiver. Number 10, Nelson Aguilar had his best year ever with the Raiders, could be back with the Raiders next year. Wouldn't be surprised. He's actually found a role as a deep threat, and that's interesting. He had a pass of playing in the slot, and you have to find the right spot for Nelson Aguilar, and he can be a very productive player, but he's not a number one he is like a number, good number three, like a okay number two wide receiver, in my opinion. So those are the wide receivers, guys. Let's take a look at the undervalued and the buyer beware. So the undervalued, you'll see some guys that aren't in the top 10. T.Y. Hilton, I think is undervalued because I think last year, late last year, he was actually coming on and playing very well. And I think if he could do that again with the quarterback that he has some chemistry with as a number two wide receiver, I think T.Y. Hilton can be very productive. The problem with T.Y. was he was playing as a number one, and I don't think he is that anymore. Indianapolis, he struggled last year, but I think if you sign him as a number two, he'll be good. Rashad Perryman, I think has very high ceiling still. He's shown it the last two years. He was hurt this past year, but I think... In a better offense with a better quarterback, he has all the tools to be a really good downfield target and an explosive player. Keelan Cole is a guy that I've always liked. I think he has good quickness, speed, route running. He could play a little bit of everywhere. I think he's just an underrated receiver. I'd love him as a number three receiver, and I think in a better situation, he'd be very productive. Buyer beware, AJ Green. He's just old. He's slow. I don't see him getting better. I only see him regressing. And just overall, his efficiency as a player last year was gross. So I'm not, I love AJ Green, but I think his days are behind him. Juju, I talked about it a little bit, but I would not pay him as a number one. Pay him as a high end number two, and I'll be happy. But if you're expecting Juju to be the star of the show, he's going to make himself the star of the show. He's going to dance on TikTok and you're going to get yourself in trouble and you are probably going to have a head case on your hands. So there are some downsides to Juju Smith-Schuster as well. So those are the wide receivers, guys. Wide receiver really wanted to discuss because that's an awesome position this year in free agency. Tight end, we're going to be a little bit quicker with. The tight end position this year, we have three or four really awesome starting caliber, top 10 even, caliber tight ends. The rest of the list isn't so exciting. We have some young players that might have some potential, some veterans that are going to be really reliable. And Hunter Henry and Jonu Smith are the headliners that I think could be on the move to go elsewhere that I think might be able to actually break out on their second team. So let's take a look at the top 10 tight ends. Hunter Henry. Hunter Henry is the best tight end here. I think Hunter Henry could be a Pro Bowl level tight end, like a all pro even. In an offense that features him as the number two target, I think he's going to be awesome with a good quarterback. I think he hasn't really been utilized correctly in LA or in San Diego, depending on how you look at it. I just feel like in a different place that knows how to utilize tight ends, Henry's always had the talent. He's just been hurt a little bit here and there, but I think he's coming into his own as like a really good player. Jonu Smith is one of my favorite tight ends in the league. As you guys know, I think physically he's one of the best in the league. He's continuing to get better and is not utilized enough. I think if he was utilized more, he would be way more known, probably way more productive Jonu Smith could be the guy that if he gets an opportunity to be 
someone that's targeted a lot could just go off like a thousand yards. I could certainly see that in a new destination, but I don't think that's really going to happen for him in Tennessee. Gronk's only going to Tampa, so he doesn't really count. <laughs> Jared Cook, maybe he ends up back in New Orleans, but he sounds like a guy that's going to be moving on because of New Orleans cap situation. He'll go to a team that's in contention that needs a tight end. That's probably where he's going to go. I think Jared Cook's still a pretty good player. Gerald Everett is a guy that I have no idea if he's good or not, honestly, but he's young. He's shown some flashes of promise, and that's enough for some teams. Dan Arnold, I think, is underrated. I think when I watch him, he's a pretty good player. He's a good route runner, good receiver overall, and I think he could find a home as a low-end tight end one. Jordan Reed, I think, still got some years left in him as a good number two tight end. Can fill in as a number one if need be. Vance McDonald, solid blocking tight end as well as can catch the football. He had a season like a couple years ago with the Steelers where he was like 60 plus catches. You know, he was really good for them. And I'm surprised that they moved off of him so significantly, you know, the last couple of years or the last year at the very least when they moved to Eric Ebron more exclusively. But I think he'd be a good number two tight end. Tyler Eifert, you just got to be concerned because he's only really a receiver and he's not as athletic as he used to be. Trey Burton is athletic, but he's not a blocker. He's very one-dimensional. He's a number two, number three tight end in this league, in my opinion. Now taking a look at the undervalued and the buyer beware tight ends, Johnny Smith, I think is undervalued because as I said, I think he could be elite if you give him the opportunity and the touches. Dan Arnold's undervalued because I think I look at him as a tight end one. I think a lot of people don't really know who he is. Anthony Ferkser, I think, is underrated. I think he can play fullback, tight end, block, catch, you know, do all that stuff. And he always seems to get open. I don't know what it is. He doesn't feel like a good tight end, but he just is open, man. Buyer beware, Gerald Everett, because I don't know how good he is. Tyler Eifert, because I think he could get injured at any time, as he has multiple times in the past. And he doesn't block. So, like, he's a one-dimensional, not athletic tight end who doesn't block. Like, I don't, I don't want that guy. That's just my opinion. Those are the tight ends. Let me know what you think about those tight ends. Some interesting ones there.